It's a pleasure to be here, and um, without further ado, this talk consists of personal narratives. The tales unravel how I arrived at inklings and understandings of archives and disciplines, of time and space, of modernity and identity, of history and ethnography. At stake are intimations that are at once familiar and strange. For, born to anthropologist's parents, I grew up in Sagar, central India, not Karnatak, Delhi, old and new, and Simla, or Shimla now. My formative years were imbued with a lingering sense of how time spaces of the vernacular and the cosmopolitan ever overlapped, yet only met each other in curious, quirky, and contradictory ways. A little later, seeking my vocation in research and teaching, I was strained in history, but drawn toward anthropology, especially as I cut my pre-apprentice scholar teeth on something called subaltern studies. The story has done the rounds, but it bears another telling. During the second half of the 1970s, a small group of enthusiastic younger historians of South Asia, several of them then in England, held a series of meetings with a distinguished senior scholar of colonial India, Ranajit Guha, who taught history at the University of Sussex. Those who met thus shared a mutual political sensibility born of the events. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just have like. Um, <clears throat> so, those who met in Sussex and other parts of <clears throat> the green and pleasant lands of England, uh, those who met in this manner shared a mutual, mutual political sensibility born of the events surrounding 1968 and the Maoist Naxalbari movement in Eastern India. Their spirit was sustained by a certain radicalism of the 1970s and sharpened by the police and administrative excesses that marked the state of political emergency between 1975 and 77 in India. The purpose of these discussions in England and India was to thrash out a new agenda for the historiography of the subcontinent, an agenda that recognized the centrality of subordinate groups in the making of history. These groups, referred to as subalterns, were seen as rightful but disinherited protagonists in the making of the past. The idea was to thereby redress the elitist imbal imbalance of much of the writing of history. Thus, subaltern studies was born. Actually, from the latter half of the 1970s, critical departures were afoot in the history of the subcontinent and wider worlds. Uh, actually, can you hear me at the back? So it's, it's all right, yeah? Thanks. Especially important were imaginative readings of historical materials. From conventional archival records, including reports of colonial administrators, through to earlier ethnographies as sources of history. And from previously maligned vernacular registers of history, through to diverse subaltern, subordinate, subordinate expressions of the past. Such readings could problematize the very nature of the historical archive, as well as initiate conversations with other orientations, including those, for example, of structural linguistics and critical theory. No less salient were incipient acknowledgments of the innately political character of history writing. In this wider scenario, attending the History Honors undergraduate program in St. Stephen's College, several of my cohort and I were insinuated in the intellectual excitement that surrounded the emergence of subaltern studies. Soon, pursuing a master's in modern history, also in Delhi University, the debates and ferment of those times led to wider critical engagements with historiographical and theoretical currents underway. Here, here, even as subaltern studies powerfully pointed us in newer historical di directions, the, the endeavor also appeared as a little skewed. It seemed to privilege the spectacular moments of the subaltern subordinate groups overt rebellions over, over these groups, more routine, everyday 
articulations, negotiations of power. This suggested, in turn, inadequate, abbreviated articulations of culture and consciousness, of religion and caste within the project. Unsurprisingly, seeking a research theme, I was interested in studying the conduct. It was, you know, speaking of the 1980s. I was interested in studying the conduct of a resistance in a religious idiom. At stake was the manner in which the institutions and imaginings of caste, the practice and processes of Hinduism, dominant and popular, could critically structure and shape the actions and expressions of subordinate communities. For a subject of study, I chanced upon a heretical and untouchable caste sect, a very large one, the Satnamis of Chhattisgarh. The auspices of my parents proved important here, both having conducted ages ago their doctoral research in this large linguistic and cultural re uh, region in central India, and a state now. Working toward an anthropological history of the Satnamis, the potentialities and problems of subaltern studies came to the fore. On the one hand, the analyses within the endeavor located the actions of these groups as entirely contempor contemporaneous with the time space of the British colony and the Indian nation. Thus, in his writings about the peasant insurgent in 19th century India, Guha rendered this historical subject as completely a co-constituent of processes of politics under colonialism <clears throat> and partly nationalism. On the other hand, the sensibilities, on the other hand, the sensibilities of a recuperative paternalism meant that within the project, the meanings and motivations of these people appeared sieved through the master distinction between community and state. The subalterns thus inhabited also a distinct prior, a priori time. This temporality turned on an implicitly unchanging tradition, shaped by the dead hand of ruling culture. Thus, it was only when these subordinate groups claimed the essence of their initiatives in total insurgency that they emerged at the cutting, at, they emerged at the cutting edge of modern politics. Of course, I did not experience or express matters in quite this manner, but the intimations of the uncertainty haunted a shadowy presence. Indeed, far from being disabling, the ambiguity was productive. The ambiguity within subaltern studies was productive. A sign of the times, the tension was fruitful. Now, alongside other theoretical tendencies, I critically engaged, alongside other theoretical tendencies, I critically engaged subaltern studies. Here, I built on their sensibility, I built on those of their sensibilities that place dispossessed protagonists as being formatively a part of history. But I also queried their emphases that presented these subjects as being uncertainly out of time. Thus, Seeking to understand Satnami articulations of the past centered on their gurus, preceptors, I found in the group's myths a modality of historical consciousness. This historical consciousness elaborated distinct conventions. Here were to be found procedures that accessed and exceeded Brahman kingly and popular devotional configurations, but also imperial, but also imperial and nationalist representations. Quite simply, Satnami conceptions of the past were entirely coeval with modern historiography, even holding a mirror up to the conceits of history writing, rather than being just an exotic exception. In hindsight, I was exploring processes that braided time, space, and their enmeshments. I had discovered, I had discovered not only the paucity, but the perversity of the archive. I had found also the predilections and plenitudes of the archive. And so on to another vignette. In the summer of 1868, the Reverend Oscar Lohr of the German Evangelical Mission Society initiated mission work in Chhattisgarh, drawn to the region by the Satnamis. Lohr's preliminary inquiries had revealed that the Satnamis were heathens with a difference. They were a monotheistic group 
whose creed was opposed to idolatry and caste. To the missionary, this was a providential collection, willed by the Lord. Would it be long before the, would it be long before the deliverance of the flock flocked once it witnessed the Savior? Yet the Satnamis did not accept the arrival of the millennium. Declining its destiny, the community proved to be elusive for projects of conversion to Christianity. In recent years, in recent years, we've had forceful reminders that the Euro-American man, the Western man, did not always command the initiative in processes of cultural encounter. In the autumn of 1868, Oscar Law visited the Satnami Guru at his home in Bhandar during the community's annual festival. The missionary described in detail how he sat next to the Guru, served refreshments there. He made the triumphant revelation to a great, great mass of Satnamis that the real Satyanam, true name, was Jesus Christ. Elated by the warm welcome, Lord ventured inadvertently into the realm of ethnographic representations, the pursuit of indigenous meanings. Um, he stated that the Satnamis had stroked his beard to show him great honor and affection in their traditional way. Missionary hype went on to see, the event, see in the event monumental historical significance. But was the stroking of Lore's long flowing beard really the enactment of a timeless, mysterious, and customary ritual? Or was it, a, was it merely a display of Satnami curiosity? Was the serving of refreshments to the missionary by the guru an expression of deference to a white sahib? Alternatively, did this extension of hospi hospitality follow a different logic? Did this extension of hospitality signify, quote, the moral and conceptual subordination of the guest to the host, unquote? To the hundreds of Satnamis gathered in Bhandar, had Lohr's visit on the day of Guru Puja unwittingly signified his ex um, um, to the hundreds of Satnamis gathered in Bhandar, had Lohr's visit on the day of Guru Puja unwittingly signified his acceptance of a subordinate role within the domain of the Guru's authority. Three months later, the missionary unknowingly challenged a key principle of faith, the wearing of the sacred thread within Satnam Panth. Satnamis are very subversive, the Dalit, but they wear the sacred thread. The curiosity of the Satnamis did not lead to their conversion to Christianity. The hospitality of the community um, was now replaced by its hostility. The millenarian hopes of lore lay in ruins. The Satnamis became wary of the missionary enterprise. The evangelists continued to toil the field and to sow the seeds of faith. The halting enterprise of conversion um, gradually uh, in, the, in the region, gradually grew through ties of kinship and the prospects of a better life under the paternalist economy of mission stations. Over the next few decades, the missionary enterprise in the region expanded. Evangelists of other denominations, the American and General Conference Mennonites, the Disciples of Christ, the Methodists, the Pentecostal bands of the world, joined members of the German Evangelical Mission Society. There were moves to work with different communities. The con converts continued to understand missionary injunctions and to interpret Christian truths through the filters of regional cultures. The harvest was never bountiful. The harvest was, ve was very curious. The missionaries tended, the missionaries reaped. If they made headway, they also had to retrace their steps. Perversely, I had found another set of incredible archives in St. Louis, Missouri, Goshen, Indiana, Newton, Kansas, and other elsewheres, uh, such as Tennessee and Madison in the US. I'm suggesting, of course, that stories of the remotest of past have their beginnings in recent tales. During another dull and dusty summer in central India, I was an optimistic youth hopelessly haunting the local judicial record office in the city of Raipur. My search was for records that detailed 
the working out of conflicts between lower caste Satnami tenants and upper caste landlords in the, Chattis, in the Chhattisgarh region in the late 19th century. It was a characteristically naive thing to do. Almost 100 years ago, the colonial government had destroyed these records. As all prospects appeared lost, I met Sattar. Um, <clears throat> Sattar, actually. I mean, he's called Sattar, but the name is Sattar. A Muslim from Maharashtra who had settled in Raipur, he worked in the records office as a peon, as a chaparasi. Now, Sattar was a lush. By 11 in the morning, he was pleasantly high. By 1 in the afternoon, uh, reasonably and sometimes unreasonably drunk. And three hours later, he was lost to the world. I'd seen him earlier when I had first walked into the records office. Then, as I pleaded in vain to be allowed a look, one look, at the countless yellow-gray files lying in endless unhappy piles. Finally, when my face had fallen completely, totally, and as it seemed then, irrevocably. On each occasion, poised strategically on a landing close by, Sattar had uttered the same sequence of sardonic sounds. Here were a sigh, followed by silence, and then the laconic lament, or kakaris, what else to do? An earnest researcher, an earnest researcher, I had paid little attention to this funny but sad man, an anonymous alcoholic. All this was to change that hot Friday afternoon when I stood near the records office waiting for a bus or a rickshaw or a tempo, anything that would carry me away from the dashed desires turned to rubble scattered at my feet and everywhere I looked. Sattar walked up, staggering a little, leaned over and whispered confidentially, quote, their records, records, records inside about murder, rape, murder, unquote. By rape, Sattar had meant illicit sexual relationships. The moment of high drama ended, Sattar retreated into himself, then sighed, fell silent, and inevitably announced, or kakaris, what else to do? Yet my chase had begun. The many complicated dealings with Bade Babu, the cynical, the somewhat cynical Brahman high priest of the records office that gained me access and then permission to photocopy the records over several months is a tale within the tale. It is best reserved for another time. Sattar had led me to an ethnographic historian's gold mine. Thousands upon thousands of pages of material on conflicts and the disputing process, often involving mayhem and murder between members of families and clans, castes and communities in 20th century colonial Chhattisgarh. Routinely, the records should have met their end several decades ago. Saved because of administrative bungling, they have suggested a large project. A large project on the interplay of <clears throat> official state conceptions and community popular contentions of crime and criminality, legality and property, authority and morality, including rival ways of understanding the person. The records contain villain stories, tales of transgressions and enmities, kinship and neighborhood, gender and age, authority and honor, caste and boundaries and witchcraft and infanticide. An, an offer is an archive. An offer is an archive of the complex interchange of everyday norms, familiar desires, <clears throat> and alien legalities. The reciprocal determinations of imperial law and village life, modernity and subalternity on the ground. Sattar, I believe, retired long ago. Put differently, as it is sometimes said in Chhattisgarh, he has retired now. Yet I continue to wo work with a boon, the knowledge of a secret which Sattar granted me. Let me then dedicate this talk to Sattar, my comrade and co-conspirator. Is this dedication theatrical? Is this dedication perverse? I'm quite certain what Sattar would have said. Or Kakaris. Another archive lost and found. There's an expressionist and Dalit artist, possibly the most prominent, called Savi Savarkar. 
I first met Savi in the late autumn of 1999. I did not know him nor his work. It was an un entirely unexpected encounter at a party celebrating Diwali, Deepavali, in the bright premises of the Indian Embassy in Mexico City. As well-dressed women and smartly spruced men came and went in an open arena and in enclosed rooms, speaking of friends and family, a dark man in casual clothes walked up to me. He was a little uncertain, a trifle diffident. I inhabited a quiet corner, fleeing from the fiesta. He introduced himself as Savi, an artist who had recently arrived on an exchange program between the Mexican and Indian governments. As Savi and I talked, our mutual interests in cultural politics and political cultures of caste and untouchability became palpable. In what seemed as little more than moments, the traces of Savi's diffidence disappeared and I no longer wanted to run away from the party. Indeed, Savi soon reached into his satchel, never far from hand, and produced a striking catalogue from a recent exhibition of his work. Even a casual glance through the catalogue was enough to establish that Savi himself was Dalit, an expressionist, and that his work embodied a profound challenge to establish procedures of art in India and beyond. Not surprisingly, our first meeting, um, our first meeting has led to several subsequent encounters and entanglements. Blending the personal and the professional, these trysts have resulted in an abiding friendship that has grown over time. That friendship is itself an archive which keeps proliferating. You've witnessed that archive today, or aspects of that archive today. A last, uh, a last vignette. Um, there are times, I'm sorry, a last vignette. There are times in life when it is impossible to find a new affect an understanding without losing prior beliefs and certainties. Distillations of the concerns that inform this talk intimated themselves to me around a decade ago, a little over a decade ago. At that time, as dementia extolled its cost, light was slowly fading from my mother's eyes. Alongside, in the wake of the global economic crisis that began in 2008, the 1%, actually the plutocratic 0.1%, announced themselves across latitudes and longitudes as the doers and undoers of relentless capital, the world, the globe, the planet. Possibly, it was this conjunction of the impending death of the remaining parent, alongside the growing salience of an entitled elite, that led me to a curious, um, that led me to a curious research project, namely a study of my own high school cohort, principally subjects of privilege, a return journey of sorts to childhood a return journey of sorts to childhood and adolescence, innocence and its absence, the past and the present. The archives are amazing, from Facebook photographs to sociable and even wildish times within, with the cohort, including having some stay at our home in Mexico. In, in, incredibly, that project has expanded to cover, incredibly, that project has expanded um, <clears throat> To, um, to, to cover um, many more modern subjects, also of, effect, also of subjects also of effect and entitlement, friendship and prejudice, prejudice memory and hierarchy, gender and sexuality, um, subjects that inhabit places uh, of prerogative. Unsurprisingly, at stake equally, unsurprisingly, at stake equally, are the terms of privilege that course through my own routine life worlds of intellectual, unsurprisingly at stake equally are the terms of privilege that course through my own routine life worlds of intellectual entitlement and cultural capital. Long glimpse, but now charged with a discrete force, a distinct gravity. Here, here are arenas where university presidents and academic regions ambassadors and diplomats increasingly come to imagine themselves in the likeness 
of the plutocratic untouchable set, albeit with relentless wealth and its command substituted by institutional authority and arrogance. Throughout, throughout conjoining fieldwork and homework, don't forget it began as a project on the school, and throughout conjoining fieldwork and homework, my instinctive routine ethnographies of the academic and intellectual everyday have betokened other verities. To wit, the very smell and sniffing of privilege and hierarchy insinuate anxieties of entitlement and authority, which often rise with heightened mediocrity and connected conceits. Such are the, dis dis such are the disagreeable quotidian worlds in which this stock was written. But we should not forget that the provocations of these domains have led me also in curious keys to other overlapping truths. The point is, the point is that longing and loss undo old, the point is that longing and loss undo older truths and instate unsettling actualities, new histories, newer archives. Thank you. <clears throat>
and you have mentioned about incorporating the importance of the physical into the archive uh, such as i don't know perhaps the the sensual the sensuous uh, what kinds of sights and smells and that was very nicely brought out in how your talk was written as well so uh, in a purely imaginative endeavor what would an archive that could uh, embody as well as grant its audience some sense of these perceptions and feelings look like to you? What you know, ways? Yeah, yeah. I mean, let me just sort of, um, uh, you know, clear the ground a bit. Uh, you know, there's this, um, um, there's this fabulous, there was this fabulous uh, historical anthropologist uh, from Haiti called Michel Rolf Struyo. He wrote a brilliant book. Um, yeah, uh, Rolf unfortunately died. Um, he had a stroke and then died young. He wrote this brilliant book called Silencing the Past. And Silencing the Past effectively focuses on the question of power and the production of history. But that doesn't mean that that power is something which obliterates the telling of tales. His book, you know, he begins by saying he came from a very prominent um, uh, black uh, um, French, black, um, Haitian family of precedents and, you know, authors and um, he himself wrote brilliantly. Um, and he says that history sat on, you know, history sat at their dining table. Okay? Now, if you look at the notion of history um, as something which is not just out there somewhere, but something which, in something which inhabits our lives, then what happens to the archive? Is it to the archives? Are they just something which are there? Of course they are there. Of course they exist in terms of, you know, the way in which, um, you know, in, in the way in which they can be knowledge is ordered, they can be open-ended archives, the very process, and you know this better than I do as an archivist, um, that, you know, they can be, they can be, um, they can be, um, they can be configured in open-ended ways, they can be closed, they can be, you know, I mean, the archives, which the, at least two of the, the ones which I mentioned, um, for example, uh, the, the American Mennonites in Newton, Kansas, they're just incredibly well organized, and they're very open about, you know, um, about, about, the, um, about letting, giving access to these archives, and in fact, both in, and this, would, this is the way you inhabit the archive is important as well, and the institutional ways in which, um, ways in which um, the access is granted. They realized very early that I like to work at night. This was in Newton, Kansas, and Goshen, Indiana, and they actually gave me the keys to the archive. You know, that, that would be unimaginable in the way in which archives are. And it's not about a particular political regime. The way in which archives are actually policed. Okay? Uh, but so where I'm going with this is that archives are also, much like history, are not just you know, forms of knowledge, of professional knowledge, which are out there somewhere. That they're intimacies of the archive. Okay? This does not mean you know, that the question of uh, the, you know, that everything is an archive and therefore we can write in any kind of a way. You know, archives raise the question also, archives and histories raise the question also um, of our responsibility to, uh, you know, to, to our responsibility to facts as well, as it were. But, you know, facts are not just also, not just something which is simply given a priori. What about uh, construing facts and archives, histories and archives, of construing facts, histories, and archives in, um, in unanticipated ways, which is what I'm getting at. Histories, archives, and facts, based on facts, which speak not um, in the voice of dead certainties, but which bring out um, which speak in the echoes instead of limiting doubt, right? That's um, quite 
quite a lovely way of putting it. It, it reminds me of that, there's a poem by Bertolt Brecht where he says, uh, well, the, the grand narrative of history is of course written by the victors, but uh, who are the ones doing the writing? Mm -hmm. Or you have a name on the monument, the one he brings up in a poem is Shah Jahan, and he says, who are the workers who built them? Where are mm -hmm. their names? Mm -hmm. So I think it is an interesting and a very radical exercise to, to sort of think about how you could reimagine an archive. Um, but also, it kind of leads you to ask the question, who are these archives for? Um, they are, of course, sources of knowledge. They are repositories of histories, but who has access to them? Because on a very uh, ground level, if I, as an interested person, were to go to an archive mm -hmm. and say, well, I would like to have, I would like to see what you hold in your collection, the first thing I'm asked is, well, of course, who are you? Where are you from? Why do you want to read this? Mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of permission, or the kinds of credibility that I have to produce in order to be able to access it is in itself a barrier for so many people. Don't you think? At no, least, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, to speak about the pre protean nature of the archive doesn't mean that, you know, they're outside, it's away from the protean, doesn't mean any kind of a discounting you know, of forces of domination, of exclusion. In fact, that's what I'm pointing towards. You know, what I'm pointing towards is, but um, is, is the fact that, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, is, is the fact that you have the exclusionary dimension of the archive, which goes together actually with the exclusionary dimension of history writing. As you said, it's, you know, written by the victors. But there are those other intimations, those other hauntings, right? Uh, so, you know, in some senses, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aspect of, uh, I think, you know, perhaps we're talking past each other, because in some senses, it is, you're trying to sort of put me in, you know, but I want to speak, you know, I want to, what I'm pointing towards is that, our, you know, archives are about incarcerations. They're about institutional. The protein doesn't mean that, um, you know, that, that they don't have profoundly institutional, di archives don't have profoundly institutional dimensions. And that these institutional dimensions are profoundly uh, linked to questions of power. You know, there is a certain, um, it's not an irony, but there is a certain um, critical attribute of archives. You know, so many archives are housed in, you know, in, Pre, you know, in previously imperial and colonial arenas. They are archived actually in prisons. You know, this is true of Cape Town. This is true of Mexico City. Uh, you know, um, so is there actually a recording of history? I mean, regimes didn't, you know, build archives to to, to, for future generations of historians. These were registers of controlling populations. These were registers of rule, right? So, um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, registering the protein, you know, the, the, the multiplicity of the archives, the lived nature of the archive, uh, you know, uh, lose, you know, cannot be done, or that it, you know, it's precisely within these registers of, of authority, of power, of dominance, that you find other glimmers, okay? So I'll give you an instance. There's a historian, died recently in Mexico, very famous historian, um, um, called, um, called Adolfo Gili. Uh, Gili uh, was jailed by, not the colonial regime, just, you know, by um, a nationalist, authoritarian Mexican regime in the 1970s, in the 1970s for his uh, suspected and well-known actually, um, left sympathies. A little somewhat later, um, you know, uh, the prison where he was incarcerated was turned into, well, an archive. And Gilly went on to work in the archive in which he had been imprisoned. Are you getting my point about it? You know, we tend to make a difference between, um, between power and, um, you know, uh, we tend to make a difference between power on the one hand 
and um, it's, um, it's undoing on the other. Uh, but power has its productivities, you know, and that which opposes it can actually be shaped by authority. So what I'm, what I'm basically getting at is, let me concretize it by saying um, that, you know, I had um, these, you know, I had these two students, one of whom had worked as Jilly's research assistant. So I actually asked these two, two students from, you know, who are historians of Mexico to write a paper um, of doing a form of field work questions, but, you know, not, not just set questions, but sort of um, critical, you know, they were historians, but a form of ethnography, having conversations with Jilly about what was it like, okay? What was it like to work um, in the archive? Um, you know, to work in the archive where he had once been imprisoned. And it was actually quite, uh, um, you know, quite a moving and moving, compelling and challenging essay. So are you, are you, you know, so I mean, you know, my point actually is can we see the institutional dimensions of the archive, what they exclude, you know, that they, but the ways in which the archives are institutionalized and the ways they exclude themselves carry uh, these forms of exclusion, these forms of institutionalizations themselves have stories to tell, right? They're not just that they happen in a manner which is already known. Those stories need to be recounted, but you rec need to recount as well that the people who are telling those stories in these manners, right? Um, there's, there's more which happens in the archives than the dry study of history. You know, romances happen in the archives. You know, breakups happen in the archives. Um, you know, uh, there's love lost, you know, and archives found. So can we actually bring in, my point is precisely about the lived dimension of, of the archive. And these um, archives are, you know, are about, uh, to, to look at it, this is to actually reimagine not just the archive. My entire point is that I'm not approaching these questions from the archi archive as a settled, as a kind of a settled habit. Okay, I'm looking at the archives much more in terms of what are our responsibilities of the kinds of histories, uh, the kinds of ethnographies, the kinds of human sciences we write, but also the very ways in which we imagine lives, subjects, and what's going on around us. So essentially a collection of lovely stories that you attempt to access and understand and see what you can draw from. So, uh, on another note, uh, sort of moving towards uh, your experiences of ethnography in Chhattisgarh, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the paintings you had up there? I know you've already spoken about them, but they form yeah, a very yeah. interesting, not I mean, a you know, background to the talk. I'm, I'm actually referring to, uh, no, I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was a sort of a deliberate, um, move, uh, that it was actually to say uh, that rather than preening and pretending and trying to relate, you know, I was trying, you know, um, what was going on behind, you know, just going on behind, uh, behind me in terms of the screen and saying this is how this aspect of my talk relates to that particular image. I'm, I was actually referring, I was actually showing the fact that, you know, here is another archive, okay? And which is, here's another archive, but it, it depends on, you know, the ways of our, not just the ways of our reading, but the ways of our looking, the ways of our expl expl exploring. And in doing so, my point is that in an archive like that, you know, I don't want to take command of that archive. You know, I don't want to orchestrate it. I don't want to, because that would be another form of you know another jail, Power, another yes. form of incarceration, but it's actually more. Rather than write you know a history, you know those muscular histories, uh, you know which pretend to know everything. What about 
what this archive suggested, what, uh, the, the fact that whatever I write about Savi's work and art at large, you know, a critical modernism, that archive is larger than I am. It's always going to be larger. So in some senses, it's about recognizing, you know, our limits, but also the possibilities which arise from them. What happens, you know, when you, when you recognize that, you know, that, you know, you cannot sort of um, orchestrate worlds or histories or archives in overwrought, uh, conceited ways. What happens if you recognize the limits of one's understanding? And, you know, I speak of all this with my gray hair, of having been around for a long time. Again and again, it is actually about, I, when I question academic privilege, okay, or uh, intellectual privilege, it's about querying. It's about questioning. All these, you know, all that I'm saying, which might sound loopy, can actually be broken down to two facts. It's about recognizing that histories like lives and worlds are not about this or that, but they're about this <coughs> and that. And it's about recognizing the importance of querying our own presumption, our own assumption, which upholds arguments, which upholds up, because these come before the histories we write or the histories we live. The, you know, the, 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 the pronouncements we make, the, so the, the lived dimension, you know, the, what I'm speaking of, the lived dimension, the sort of, you know, the description about, about these protean nature of the archives is relating to, is related actually to seeing um, that the archive the effective archive, the imminent archive, is actually tied to lives. And I think otherwise, you know, you have, you know, you have, um, um, you have these um, narratives of history and ethnography, which are, you know, which privilege the author mm -hmm. uh, in one way or another, which doesn't ask hard questions of ourselves. You know, what's the point of doing this stuff um, if you're doing more and more of the same, a business as usual. Fair enough. That, that was a very nice way of putting it. <laughs> Do we have time? OK. All right. Then I am also thinking about uh, the idea of trying to, I don't want to say document, but trying to build, what about an archive of oral histories where memory is always fallible and ever-changing, and as years go by, it, the, the narratives become hazier, or they differ with the impact of other memories hitting against them. So out of, I, there are, of course, ethnographers who work with oral history, who work with collecting stories and documenting them. But is there a way we can go beyond simply documenting them? What do you, this is just a, a question off the top you know, of my head. In some senses, I think it's, it's about the sort of, um, you know, one thing we you need to recognize, and it's, you know, um, it's very existential. I like this dialogue because we're coming from very different ends, right? Um, you know, I'm <laughs> sort of, you know, I've, um, I've um, let's just put it this way, you know, I'm in my early 60s, <laughs> you know, I've been around, I've, you know, I've haunted archives and archives have haunted me, <laughs> you know, you are in, an art historian who's going to begin a, a, a PhD on, um, you know, out of literature, but concerning, you know, stately homes and... Potentially, yes. Yeah, I mean, not potentially stately or potential. Oh, well, potential I'd say potentially PhD. stately. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what interests me is that archives have a lot of possibility. Hmm? And but that's exactly, exactly what I'm saying. Oh, I'm precisely. Speaking, you know, but I'm, I'm speaking again and again. I'm, not speak, I'm speaking of the, the possibility of the archives, uh, of the archive, uh, re, you know, uh, it, it, it uh, inheres in you know, in registering also, not just the productivities, mm -hmm. but also the paucities. Mm 
and the perversities. Okay? And it's, it's what, um, you know, it's the way in which, uh, it's the way in which we ask certain kinds of questions. And this is in terms of, it's about, you know, it is, of course, a critique of those archives which obliterate memory, as you're saying, which is, but if we see, see the task as one of recuperating a kind of a pure memory, you know, that purity, that innocence is not of the world. So if you're going to collect a memory of, for example, you know, um, if you collect, uh, of, of memories, of, you know, of memories of, let's say, violence, these archives would not just be about documenting certain kinds of voices. They would be, you know, uh, archives as much of silences as of what is spoken. What is, you know, what is included and what is in excluded. These, was, these would be archives where the very words which are elicited speak of pain and loss. And if you forget that, you know, that elision, as it were, that excision, of loss, pain, you know, you forget the meanings of the archive, you know, you have, right? So it is, documents. it's about bringing actually, what is the point of it? There's a, you know, there's a certain, um, there's something awful happening there that you want to, you know, you're claiming that you're going to give them agency, mm -hmm. you're going to recover them as subjects. But excuse me, they've been subjects of pain, loss, of violence, can we actually be register? And this was my point. Can we actually register that that pain, violence, loss, those lived lives, lives are larger mm -hmm. than what we are attempting? It's about recognizing one's limits. That doesn't mean that you don't go harder at doing what you have to do. In fact, that impels you to, yes. to do it all the better. It's about responsibility. Um, towards. That's a very nice way of putting it. It is about responsibility and it is about capturing everything that an archive cannot, which but is lovely. You know, it's also, I mean, I'll end this part by telling a story um, which might, you know, since you work on literature, it might interest you. So the poet W.B. Yeats, uh, apart from writing brilliant poetry, was really interested in fairies, elves, gnomes, and such like. And he used to haunt, and I deliberately use the term haunt, because we forget the specters, the hauntings of history. You know, we forget, we think we can tame it, but history haunts. Um, so, you know, he'd haunt, he would haunt the Irish countryside looking for stories about elves, gnomes, um, fairies. So he met, um, I forget now, um, he met, we'll call her um, Mrs. O'Brien. Mrs. O'Brien was in her late 70s. Uh, she was a fount of stories. Um, so they had a lovely long discussion. He, you know, he filled up one of his wonderful um, kind of leather bound notebooks or half of it, you know, I'm telling a story, <laughs> okay? Uh, the point is, does it matter, you know, how much he felt? Um, so uh, he did so, and um, they had tea, they had um, scrumpets. Um, she used to bake very well. Um, this is a part of the archive, it's a part of the story, because this, those were the textures through which, and the terms, and the smells through which the stories were collected. Anyway, the point of it is that, you know, it was a great um, conversation, as we'd say. At the end, as, um, you know, um, Mr. Yates woke up, uh, uh, rose up, and was leaving, he asked Mrs. O'Brien, but Mrs. O'Brien, do you believe in fairies and elves and gnomes? She said, of course not. Of course not, uh, Mr. Yates. Um, and then as uh, W.B. Yates was moving out of that little wicker gate, um, he heard Mrs. O'Brien say, but Mr. Yates, Mr. Yates, so he turned around and she said, I don't believe in them, 
That doesn't mean they don't exist. So, you know, the entire question of uh, letting our beliefs triumph the worlds which exist, can we, you know, this doesn't mean that you have to, you know, you have to believe everything, but can we actually suspend a bit of credulity and ask those difficult questions? I think that's a nice point at which we can end our discussion at least. It's about, yes, thinking about radical possibilities and trying to find ways in which to ask questions. Uh, all right, I think now we open it up to the audience. If anyone would like to ask anything. Hi, uh, am I audible? Yeah. 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 So this question may uh, seem a little unfair to a lot of people because I have the advantage of having met you yesterday also. But there's a common thread which I noticed in your talk yesterday and your talk today, which is uh, the difference between this or that and this and that, which is something you emphasized yesterday also that, you know, uh, when you were analyzing the paintings and telling us about the possible meanings and you were saying that, you know, and people were asking you, does this mean this or does it mean that? And you said, why can't we sort of look at both of them? Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to, uh, often in like, so let's say in, how do I put it? Like in most real life situations, mostly people choose between, like they judge whether this thing should be approached this way or that way. So how can we really th have that sort of a mindset of looking at things with both this and that, that sort of a mindset? Like I'm a little confused about yeah. You know, let's just uh, bring it in terms of, let's ground, let's ground this, okay? So, um, um, let's think of today's worlds. Uh, today's worlds of social media, of Facebook, of Twitter, of, uh, what is it called? Um, Instagram. Instagram. No, um, of X, X? Oh, X yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> which is itself a question of uh, meaning and power. How you know, uh, how how um, how tweet, you know, what was it called? Twitter. Twitter, Twitter was, the was re became X, um, and so so you know, I think the crucial question is that at one point when we used to talk about how understandings of reality are mediated by this, you know, that, and, and so on. But today, the question is not a mediation of this or that, right? Or this and that. It's actually about immediation. It's immediation. There is a kind of an, um, there's an incitement which we have through these forms of social media. Just, you know, you've got to choose. You've got to choose between this politician or that politician. You've got to choose between this cricket player or that cricket player, okay? Uh, you've got to choose between this footballer or that footballer. You've got to choose between, you know, between this or that. You know, it's about a certain form of, not just an imaginary, but a certain form of, you know, it, it's a certain form of, um, <laughs> of, an embodied manner in which you're being drawn into saying, you know, if you don't agree with me, you know, um, is your life worthy, okay? Now, if we were to look at it in this manner, what happens? Um, you know, we can continue to do that, or we can say no, right? Uh, this doesn't mean that you do not have opinions, but can we actually try to understand? And you know, rather than get caught up in that immense violence, okay? So I'm taking an example of, you know, which is why I, you know, I pointed towards, suggested towards, towards Facebook as an archive in relation to my own high school cohort, but more. Can we actually look at these questions of uh, the protean archive in terms of also of incitements to silencing other voices, right? So the, you know, which is why I'm bringing in the question of the archive in relation to, you know, the registers of our life, right? And I mean, the the the, you know, the entire question of 
immediation in relation to social media, which is all around, and we're speaking in Bangalore, for God's sake, uh, you know, is, 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 uh, is, is really important. Now, I'm not going to, you know, tell you what you, you know, what you should do about it. The point is, you know, how you should go about it. There are many ways of going about it, but the begin with is the question of asking that is this, you know, the only way in which we inhabit and experience the world? You know, wasn't it the fact that the world's, there were always opinions, people fought deeply about them, but was it done in quite this manner? So, you know, in living in the present, what does it mean, you know, to, to look at this, you know, to, this, to these terms of incitement? and enticement, you know, the, the enticement and incitements go together. What does it mean to ask hard questions about how we ourselves argue, how we ourselves live? Thanks, Saurav. Uh, it is good to see you move from, as a student of subaltern studies, from that moment of ambiguity to this moment of ambiguity where you brought us. Mm -hmm. uh, but ambiguity now being between anti-history and history, or anarchy, mm -hmm. between towing the anti-history line and history, or better history, or being anarchic, or being a disorderly order, you know, something being led by notions of responsibility, right? Um, because you're not willing to allow this kind of inquiry to land us in an abandonment of any sense of logic in how we go about retrieving experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so the paintings that you showed us, the compositions mm -hmm. alongside, I mean, what was that doing beside a narrative of this kind, vis-a-vis -vis the experience of the Satnamis? I was wondering if they were pointing to the limiting nature of any rational appropriations of however better you mean they mine may be. were rational appropriations of in yes. history writing yes. i no i mean i could have i couldn't i could have possibly done different you know written a di different that, that was my early body of work uh, which chandan is uh, sp uh, you know was speaking of so it's um, and are you saying also i have to cl get the clarification yes. Uh, before I dive into defense. Um, so are you saying that I'm defending a position of anti-history? It could. I mean, in the sense, if longing and loss will mean a continual sense of unclarity about what you're grasping, really. Uh, no, no. I mean, actually, uh, I mean, between it's, the it's, it's about actually attending. It's not that, you know... Um, uh, so there is actually... Um, I'm speaking of the responsibility to, to narration, actually. I'm speaking about the fact that we have to tell our stories, but tell our stories in a responsible, critical, imagine, but also imaginative manner. It means actually saying, and that's where this question comes in, you know, why are we afraid of loss and longing in speaking of narratives? Actually, you know, in whether it's colonial histories or it's imperial histories or it's subaltern histories, it's nationalist histories, it's histories that are, that are bound today in textbooks. There is, you know, there is actually longing for particular truths. There's a loss, you know, of, you know, of, of, of texture, you know, we, you know, it's longing and loss can actually point towards the fact that there is um, a lived dimension to histories, and that they cannot be, you know, they cannot be jailed, that they cannot be incarcerated, uh, they should not be incarcerated. So my point, actually, Chandan, is about, uh, you know, and. Actually, you know, in a sense, when I was writing about that, um, I was speaking of Satnami myths uh, as a form of historical consciousness, okay? But this was not just something, you know, of a very, very subordinate, uh, a very low caste, a very heretical group. So what's going on there? Um, and, you know, you read it, but let me just say, 
this is a form, a particular form of ordering of historical consciousness uh, in which, uh, in which, you know, the usual markers of history uh, are at once drawn upon and subverted. It's not, they're not just exotic exceptions out there. Um, so that, you know, they bring into play processes of, um, of meaning and power which sort of, which surround, for example, the, pres the presence of the nagar, which is a plow, which is an elastic measure of land, you know, which indicates uh, how many, um, how many, um, you know, how much of a particular area uh, two bullocks could, um, could, could uh, need, need, you know, how, how much uh, of the area could be worked upon by two bullocks, right? But the bullocks and the nagar were worked by agricultural laborers, and they were the satnamis. And when Guru Ghasidas, the first guru, um, you know, becomes his, he has first intimations, you know, what happens is that the, what happens is <laughs> that his marad, the vegetable growing master, falls before Ghasidas. You know, the master, who is actually middle caste, has fallen before the Satnami Guru, because why? Because he finds that the nagar, the plow, is moving on its own accord that its work, the work of, not just of drudgery, but the work of, um, you know, which marks the subordination of the agricultural labor, that has been undone. Now, uh, of course, one can say, you know, this is just a myth, this is just a story, but are there not critical markers? And this is my point. It's not just about, you know, so, so for me, it's not about, not about definitions of archives or definitions. It's about how do you track, you know, the, 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 how do you track the textures, the terms of history in terms of its different, of different registers? How do you look at the presence of power and in terms of, you know, in, in terms of its, um, in terms of its different claims, in terms of its, groundedness. So now, what happens to the Marad master? He says, Jai Guru Hasidas and falls in front of Hasidas, right? But the whole thing is orchestrated in some sense it happens with, a, with the absolutely concrete marker. You know, so I'm trying to say, I want to stay with that logic. You know, I want to stay with that logic, if you will, or those logics, which inhere in these accounts, rather than turning to an idea of this is objective history, right? And this is a larger question which, seem like, which might seem like something which we, uh, you know, which that I'm not sort of facing up to the responsibility of the historian. It's also to recognize that, you know, forms of historical consciousness vary in their degree of symbolic elaboration. They vary in their ability to, part part you know, to, to, to um, to, um, to pervade multiple contexts, you know, that, but ultimately, as he said, it's also about the fact that histories are not just out there somewhere, you know, these, these distant things. It's when you approach them, you know, let's, let's look at what ha what's happening in terms, and in terms of what's happening to history today, but, you know, um, and I don't need to go into details, but let's not forget that, you know, histories were orchestrated in a particular fashion by the imperial regime, by what came after 1947, what existed, you know, because histories matter. So it's in that sense that one has to bring our own responsibility with a sense of questioning, a sense of wonder. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is that this is not about, you know, um, you know that I'm following this fashionable trend, that fashionable trend. You know, um, I take, you know, this, this famous song um, um, <clears throat> by Bob Dylan, which goes... Um, um, there are several. Um, um, this is all along the watchtower. And he says, no reason to get excited um, that this is the thief speaking to the... Uh, this is the thief... This is the joker speaking to the thief. No reason to get excited. 
no, this is the thief he kindly spoke. There are many here among us who treat life but as a joke. But you and I, we've been through that. We know that that's not our fate. Uh, so let's not talk falsely now. The hour is getting late. Uh, outside in the distance, a wind began to howl. Two riders were approaching. A wild cat did growl. So can we actually, this is my aspect of the effect. We did forget, you know, the, not just the emotive. This is experiential. And I learned something about, um, about suspicion towards, but the articulation, the expression of history, you know, when I heard this stuff. You know, um, taught via certain fears to Vedi, whose understanding of history mm -hmm. was totally different. You know, it was, I asked my, uh, I asked my wonderful teacher, D.E.O. Baker, who's a marvelous teacher, but an empirical historian. So I read, um, I read Mario Vargas Llosa, um, uh, Mario Vargas Llosa's um, uh, 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 um, sort of Anjulia and the script writer. Um, and I was a little uncertain what sort of history that was, but then I came, I read Yosa before I read um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and then I read 100 Years of Solitude, and I went beaming to the class and asked this empirical historian um, and a wonderful person, D.E.U. Baker, who's teaching us British history. Um, but sir, why can't history be written like 100 Years of Solitude? So, you know, the loopiness is not something which I have arrived at. It was there then <laughs> as well. And it was a genuine question, and it remains a genuine question. Hello, Mr. Saurabh. This is with respect to a catastrophic event the world has seen recently, which is COVID. Yes. Just wanted to have an idea from you, if you are to write an archive on the impact of COVID in India, how would you go about it? And what are the topics that you would want to cover? You mean, how would one make an archive? Right, yeah. So uh, what are the major areas? Because we have seen a lot of impact across not just losing lives, but a lot of businesses getting stopped, a lot of initiatives getting trampled a lot of impact across emotionally and socially uh, that the country has gone through. Yes. So. Yes, I mean, it's a very, very important question. And in some senses, um, it's, it, 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 it's a very important question. And it actually goes to the heart of what I've been trying to say. It's about, uh, we can imagine. Archives are also imagined in some senses. And imagine doesn't mean that concrete or the COVID wasn't real. Um, it would be about recognizing that any, that the archives, and let's move to the plural of COVID, um, would not be singular, okay? They would be inexhaustible, you know, that they exist in terms of the way people were moving, in terms of what you've said, the businesses for, uh, going down, it was in terms of, you know, the, the, it was in terms of decisions which were being taken. It would be a visual archive of those bodies burning endlessly. It would be an archive of effect of people dying on the street, right? It would be visual. It would be, it would be oral. It would be about memories. But registering, you know, when you, you know, it would be, it would be um, um, it would be about um, you know it would be about uh, the the uh, particular ways in which uh, newspapers uh, and other social media were reporting matters, the way in which they was being discussed. Do you get my point then about the plenitude, but also in some senses the perversity of this archive? And can we actually work within this archive registering that, you know, archives are larger than if they're related. You know, they cannot just be a containment, okay? There's an enormity of the archive, but that doesn't mean one doesn't go about the task of archiving. But with these, you know, with these aspects of, this was what I meant by saying, with this, with recognizing questions of limiting doubt, 
right? Rather than dealing in debt certainties. You know, what kind of an irony would it be if COVID, were you know, its archive was treated as a debt certainty? You know, because it itself, in terms of its contentions, in terms of, you know, what was going on, it speaks of loss, longing, lives, right? So there is my point about this is not turning this discussion of history and the archive and, you know, into something which is, you know, it, into something which can be easily managed. It's about, when I say that we have to recognize our own limits and questions, it's about letting, you know, the larger aspects of life break upon us. And, and you know, that, you know, it's not as if, uh, it's not as if I'm, I'm suggesting something, you know, which is impractical. It happens again and again. It happens in literature. It happens in novels, you know. Uh, it, are, are people asked there about, uh, about those evocations, about the way in which matters are being challenged? So can we, as, you know, um, the practice of history cannot actually, um, work in the same manner, but that does not mean that we do not let the faculties, if you will, um, the ac academics <laughs> like to speak a lot about faculties, right? But um, faculties of art, faculties of science, faculties of engineering, but I want to see, you know, um, it's in that way is that you let faculties of understanding, right, uh, realize that worlds have to break upon us, you know, uh, in order to make sense of them. That we are lesser than worlds. That we are lesser than its subjects. It's just a caution, and it's there you also. And you know, that doesn't mean that it's, it's not, this is all, this is not just pontification. I'm basically suggesting that this would, if you were to speak of histories, if you were to speak of the making of ethnographies, uh, if you, of the making of archives, if you were to speak of, eth of, of eth you know, of, of the making of archives, if you were to speak of the uh, construal of ethnographies, this would lead to a better, a more sensitive, a more critical, a more self-aware, okay? Um, intellectual practice, not just academic practice, which, you know, which registers that our practices have to be a part of the world, that there is no, no autonomous knowledge, that it's a conceit which, you know, which should be given up. Not everyone's going to do it, right? But that doesn't mean that one doesn't reg register. Uh, you know, there's, the Im there's an immensity of tasks. There's not just one way of going about it. But you know, can we stop being those? I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting you. I'm. This is, you know, something which I'm, you know, saying to myself and my colleagues. And you know, can we stop being these arbiters, these final arbiters of what? This is history. This is anthropology. I'm a little tired of that. This is art criticism. A little tired of that game. So, in terms of, you know, it's an immense task. It can actually, it's not an individual one. Uh, but we, it's about carrying certain kinds of sensibilities. It's carrying a certain way of understanding. You know, of registering, as in discussion in, you know, about contemporary topics on social media, it's about registering, you know, that we are not the champions we believe we are. Hi, Saurabh. Thank you for that beautiful talk. Um, worlds breaking up upon us, and that's something that one really felt when reading your first book, because the question of myth, orality, archives, memory, all kind of floating around, and you anticipating all of them and bringing them together. And in some ways, I think it has a deep resonance with particularly studying caste, because I think your work precedes um, interesting work that's now begun happening at the intersection between historical work and ethnography. I'm thinking here of the work of Sanal Mohan and Joe Lee and the kind of struggle they have also 
of faculties, right, of, of, of jumping across faculties. And I think one of the interesting things that, have, that has come about in this talk and also in putting these three texts together is the question of myth. And I think that's something you think about very seriously. And I'm trying to understand when you see these multiple archives kind of colliding and breaking upon us, um, there's the question of how the logics of those archives, like you've talked about, and with myth, sometimes, uh, like with an archaeological site, when you enter the site, you're almost defacing it in some ways, making it unviable for for another kind of reading at some point. And similarly with myth, I think questions of when you access myth, um, trying to decode it kind of defaces it in some ways. And there are many kinds of practices, creative practices, in which accessing myth also means rewriting it or retelling it. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, what do you do with these, uh, with creative practices like you're talking about? You know, how do we undo some of the violence that academic work has already uh, unleashed by certain kinds of prejudices like you've talked about? We're not, thanks very much for that question. It's a very important one. Uh, oh, um, you know, when I teach, I don't use a mic. <laughs> Old habits die very, very hard. Um, so, um, so here's the thing. You know, it's not just prejudice which underlies uh, the way in which there's a violence which is perpetuated. It's, it's not just prejudice, it's actually also pride or vanity, you know, to go back to this. Um, to that novel by Jane Austen. It's also about pride, and it's about this form of pride which is about conceit. What I'm getting at is the following, that, you know, um, and this, let me bring together your point with, um, with, you know, with what Chandan was saying. Uh, did I, uh, in writing about myths in a particular fashion, which you've been very generous about, have I exhausted? the meanings of those myths? Uh, of course not, you know. Uh, they were one ways of, but they were one way of telling the story. And if you look at it, my, one of the points which I was making as I was going along was the fact that, you know, there is, it's a particular kind of an archive to be read in a particular fashion. You know, this is not the last word, right? Um, you know, so it's that spirit, Chandan, which I'm extending further. I mean, you know, I was, I was younger, okay? Um, it was about, but that didn't mean that I was convinced about what I was, you know, that I, mine was the last word in terms of what I was writing. What I'd be more conscious about would be leaving, um, you know, leaving some of the, leaving some of the, um, ends more open-ended. You know, I was bringing together, uh, I was, you know, in, in the very f ways in which I was writing about the politics of history writing, I was actually acknowledging that there is a certain kind of violence which happens there. But I would leave things a little more open-ended and I'm glad you question, you know, you brought in the question of, um, of, of, of the new body of work which is coming up. And, um, you know, uh, you refer to Sanal Mohan and Joel Lee. You know, my, my point there is the, in terms of the responsibility. So I have an essay um, in EPW, which appeared in then in Disciplines of Modernity, the last book, which is called Anthropological Archives. Okay, we think of archives as as, as related to history and anthropology is about field work, right? Uh, it's called Anthropological Archives. And um, it's also called Dalit Relig Religions Redux. Um, and one of the points which I'm making there is, well, there are different points, but there's a certain ferment. You mentioned two people. There's a certain ferment in kind of Dalit Bahujan writing, 
Uh, and what I'm saying is that this ferment is itself about, is recognizing this ferment is itself about recognizing that I'm writing in a particular, not just milieu, but in a particular context. My point there is that of course I have my preferences of which ones, which of the um, interpretations and which of the authors I agree more with and which are the ones I don't, uh, uh, I agree less with. But my point is also that that is immaterial. You know, that can be, because if I were to speak in terms of, oh, this one is right and that one is wrong, what I'm doing is adjudicating. The fact of this ferment is more important than who I like or dislike. So that's one of the points. And working then, so I'm, I'm just kind of concretizing some of the other stuff which I've said. And working, um, you know, this is in some senses an optic as well as a provocation. And in some senses what I'm, what I'm trying to sort of do over there is say that, you know, th there is a certain, if you will, irony about the fact that the more this kind of, and I'm glad it's happened, uh, a kind of a combative writing. Okay? A kind of a dedicated, hands-on kind of saying, you know, we're taking these positions has happened. Uh, that's great, you know? And it exists, whether I like it or not, whether I find it great or not, it exists. It's larger than me. But there's something else which is happening. There's a kind of an, you know, there's a kind of an, um, there's, there's a way in which uh, prior understandings, faulty understandings are being um, what might be called faulty understandings, and they were sort of skewed, are being entirely left out of the picture. Okay? Now what, perversely, what I'm trying to do is to say, so now, you know, Louis Dumont, the French anthropologist, is considered Brahmanical because he spoke about purity and pollution, and yes, his was a very textual Brahmanical idea of Hinduism. Uh, and of caste, and he said that, you know, um, untouchables basically, the word he used, that untouchables basically accept their subordination because it's all about ritual hierarchy of purity and pollution, which is a singular system, which has been questioned. But we forget, and this might seem like an arcane point to the, to the, to, you know, to the dedicated, um, sort of committed intellectual, and you know, it's important to, one of the facts which is, for, one of the aspects which is forgotten is that Jumo's work on India was actually a part of a trilogy, or even more. He was as interested, or you know, he was interested in India, but that was a part of his interest <coughs> in the entire question of value, power, ideology in France and in Germany. Now, in fairness, should you, do you really need him as a, as a whipping post? Or do you actually want to understand, you know, the, the formations of what Jumo is saying? I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, you know, there is more than one Jumo which I'm saying, and that's the responsibility of reading. If you're going to do it, then you're going to do it better. But there's something else, which is, um, you know, uh, there's another kind of a debate which, uh, combative, critical, Dalit historians and scholars haven't looked at which is this, this question of nature of power in caste society. So Dumont renders power epiphenomenal by saying, you know, it's all about purity and pollution. It is, you know, a, a kind of a normative order presided by the Brahman. It's all about values, okay? Uh, but this, you know, there's this other body of work which came up which looked which, which saw caste not in purity and pollution in the figure of the Brahman, it's presided over by the Brahman, but which looked at, the, who said, oh, caste was always only about politics. Okay, politics in what sense? It was in, about politics because caste was about kingship. Okay, caste was about, you know, it was not about purity and pollution in the Brahman, it was about kingship. It was about kingship in the sense that it was the relationship between the king and caste, or the dominant caste, you know, the Kamas and the Reddies, you know, for example, over here. It was that 
which was central to caste. My question is basic. It's not about an arcane de debate. So you know the 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 <laughs> like the the big men and women are going at each other. You know, like um, um, you know whatever the uh, what's it called? Um, these heavyweight um, you know wrestling things. But what's what's missed out is on the one hand. You have purity and pollution. On the other hand, you know, you have the political dimensions of caste as linked to, okay? Political dimensions of caste as linked to kingship, okay? And dominant caste, um, which seem to be mirror images. The point is, whatever happened to the Dalits, okay? Whatever happened to the Dalits uh, and, and, and the really lower caste, what, you know, and this is not just a rhetorical question. Um, if you look at, in my case, if you look at, and there could be other narratives, if you look at, uh, for example, what I examined, um, Satnami oral narratives from uh, about the early 20th century, what, what happened, what you find is that it's actually the blending, the coming together it's the blending, the coming together of forms of power and authority derived from, derived from purity and pollution, from aspects of the dominant caste or kingship, and forms of colonial power, which structured their subordination. And this comes out so vividly in what they call, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. what, they, what they refer to as Gonti Azamana, in, which is the era of the landlords. So it's not, again, you know, this or that is not just an abstract notion. It's about the fact that it's actually, purity and pollution is profoundly about power. How did, you know, why did Professor Dumont miss that? You know, that, that, that the aspect of caste in terms of kingship, kingship also excludes groups. Whatever happened about that? And what makes us think that, you know, when we talk about, when we talk about caste, what makes us think, what makes us, you know, uh, uh, consider that, that colonial rule understood as sets of symbols and practices and imaginaries did not enter everyday lives and restructure caste is, itself? Is it because we want our subalterns to be pure? their resistance of Dalit resistance to be immaculate. I mean, you know, this might seem a provocation, but I mean, these are the some of the questions which one needs to consider. So Chandan, you know, and you know, what I'm trying to say is, these are the hard questions. This doesn't mean that I've gone over to any imaginary other side, okay? It just means get real. Uh, good evening, Professor. Uh, hi. So, uh, hi. Uh, as I was listening uh, to your talk, and then it may be broadly ties uh, also to the questions asked in the audience before, uh, I was just wondering uh, if you could throw some light or your thoughts on what is subjectivity and objectivity of perception of knowledge in, in considered history or in the archival process, because if one can maybe already assume that one um, an attempt, rather, is always subjective based on many other factors which interplay, then that knowledge itself can help us maybe. Because I think then if we allow both to exist, then what is truth? I, I just, I think it gets muddled in between so much abstractness, if you will. And so I was, it's just an honest question if you thought I could get some of your thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It's a very important question, but you know, um, we we want to um, we want to consider, uh, you know, again I go back to that frame. We want to consider objectivity and subject, you know, the objective and the subjective, as dead certainties, but which itself comes out of particular formations of knowledge, right? You know, there's been a long tradition which is spe which is the phenomenological one, for example, which has sp spoken of the fact that you know, the object and the subject, which has you know, a certain bearing on the objective and the subject, subjective, object and subject uh, 
So how does it work? You know, it works in terms of um, the, okay, the different meanings of subject. So it's about the fact that you separate the object and the subject. In some senses, I'm speaking about, you know, so I am, you know, I hold the terms of objective knowledge. And, you know, I'm going to study those subjects whose understandings are subject. I hold, you know, these, I hold the truth and those guys provide me with, you know, sometimes valid, a lot of the times invalid. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to orchestrate the, that knowledge and present. But actually it's about forms of, it's about forms of exchanges, you know. Um, the analyst doesn't stand outside. You enter. I mean, you know, I don't, uh, you know, that you, I mean, this is being, actually being registered by historians and sociologists and anthropologists of science. But we proceed as if, you know, there can be. So where am I going with this? I'm going with, the, um, you know, what I'm trying to say over here is that can we actually, um, can we actually recognize that that which we study or try to understand is bound, okay, to how we try to understand it. Okay. Uh, and it's in this sense, and I, you know, one can go on about it. Um, you know, um, it's in this sense that we recognize uh, what that profound philosopher Maurice Mur Murliu Ponty said. Uh, he said, okay, and he was a Marxist, you know, he was, he was committed to forms of, you know, untangling, unraveling the world. You know, Malia Ponte said, you know, said, truth is a matter of wager. It's a matter of taking a bet with yourself, you know, because, but, and that's not true. I mean, he wasn't, you know, you can't, oh, you know, he was... So, you know, so people, the objective would say, oh, you know, that's like a cop-out. Excuse me, uncle. Excuse me, auntie. You know, we're speaking of Merleau Ponty, who spent his life, you know, not only, you know, trying to, you know, trying to untangle words, meanings, worlds, texts, archives, in his own manner. So a little humility. A little humility, a little way of being open, you know, not being adjudicatory. And on that note, on Ponty's embodied understanding of the world, uh, thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you, Professor Dubey. Thank you, Shweta, for facilitating a conversation with him.